Hey, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Beyond the Three R's, the Sustainable Packaging Challenge, which has been made possible today under the Agri-Food Accelerator Program, funded through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, the province of Nova Scotia, and the Government of Canada. My name is Nancy Tregano, and I'm a food scientist at Perennia Food and Agriculture. We offer a wide array of services to support Nova Scotia's agricultural and seafood industries, such as food safety, agricultural extension, mobile wine bottling, and analytical testing of cannabis, food, and beverages. At the Perennia Food and Beverage Innovation Centre, we also work with clients on food product and process development, shelf life, as well as food labeling. We're very fortunate today to have two experienced guest presenters with us to discuss this important topic of sustainable packaging. I'd first like to introduce Ron Lemaire, um, who's joining us today from Chile, Ontario, where it's minus 20. Um, Ron's the president of the Canadian Produce Marketing Association, which represents the interests of over 800 Canadian and international member companies who sell 90% of the produce in Canada. The CPMA is a not-for-profit association with a focus on sustainability, advocacy, marketing, partnerships, capacity building, and food systems thinking. In 2019, Ron launched the CPMA Plastic Packaging Working Group to address the use of plastics within the produce sector, to build an industry-supported roadmap for maintaining food quality and safety while reducing the environmental impact of plastics for our Canadian produce industry. Um, our second speaker will be Paul Jenkins, who's joining us from England today. And Paul is the managing director of the Pack Hub, uh, a leading packaging innovation consultancy helping brand owners, retailers, and packaging suppliers deliver a range of packaging innovation services. The Pack Hub are experts in understanding packaging trends and run a packaging innovation database with over 4,600 in initiatives from around the world. The Pack Hub also hosts packaging conferences, publish packaging reports, and offer technical packaging support. We look forward to hearing Paul's international perspectives on this hot topic. Um, some Zoom housekeeping notes. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A button. So we're really looking forward to your questions. So please put in your questions throughout the talks anytime. And at the end, we hope to have some good discussion around this topic. And lastly, um, I just wanted to mention, we're very fortunate today also to have some folks here from Divert NS and also Department of Environment. Um, we have Bob Kenny from Department of Environment as well as from Divert, we have Alana, Emily, Kurt and Catherine, and they're gonna be available as part of our Q&A session to answer any specific questions about Nova Scotia waste resource. Okay, so with with that, let's get started. And um, Ron, I'm going to turn things over to you. Okay, guys. Um, so let's get going. And uh, thank you for having me today. It's uh, exciting to uh, speak with uh, uh, individuals that uh, work within the food system uh, that are interested in seeing where we can go around the changing landscape on, on plastics and to look at and understand how complex the system is and the changes that may be necessary to see success as we move forward. Recognizing that while there is a need to address problematic and unnecessary plastics, the technology has a key role in our ecosystem relative to, as Nancy mentioned, food safety, food quality. And I'll touch on a little bit, a little bit of that. I will say, this topic is a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. Um, it just the volume of information that is out there and it just keeps coming at you nonstop. So hopefully I can provide some context is I'm going to say simplify things, but uh, we'll see how that goes through the presentation. Uh, Nancy already framed a little bit about who CPMA is. Um, I will identify we have 32 members across Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland out of the number that uh, Nancy noted. And uh, very happy that uh, and hope some of those are with us today, some of those members. But a question you may be asking, so why is a produce guy talking about plastics? And Nancy did talk a little bit about our focus back in 2019, where we phoned the work, formed the working group 
But what we also found when we began our research is the fresh produce industry represents just 5.1% of overall plastic packaging and 2% of all plastics entering the Canadian economy each year. So while we're not significant relative to the impact of plastics in Canada, we are a very visible part of that plastic iceberg. The positive thing is we are also in a unique position as CPMA because we operate across a supply chain with growers, shippers, right through to wholesale, transportation companies, and retail and food service. And with that dynamic and with our food system thinking, we have the potential to help drive change and innovation around food packaging, recycling systems, and the plastic industry as a whole. So I want to start by going over a couple of th key elements and everyone knows the plastic debate has been gaining momentum in Canada with the ocean plastics charter back in 2018. While the topic shifted slightly during the start of COVID, it hasn't dramatically changed. The federal throne speech and work currently, be, currently being done at a federal level focuses on how can the Canadian Environmental Protection Act can support an approach that accomplishes one of the following areas I'm going to talk about. One, targeting all plastic manufactured items, regardless of product type or application. So that would be an economic wide approach, an economy wide approach. The second is a target, uh, the target plastic products by resin type. So resins based approach. And the third is a targeted approach on plastic products by sector or product category. So a product based approach. Based on our work at CPMA, I want to share some thoughts and those three areas are basically provided by uh, some of the working group activity that the Environment Climate Change Canada has been focused on. But our work at CPMA has shown a couple key areas and the thoughts that I want to share link into how we need to take a harmonized and integrated approach to address our challenges, which include navigating evolving consumer demands, challenges of fragmented systems, and some tools that we have developed at CPMA to support sustainable package uh, development. So let's start with the consumer. The consumer vo voice on plastic remains very consistent. Our data shows that Canadians want to have their cake and eat it too. Um, about 76% are asking us to find ways to reduce plastic, but do not impact the availability of the product, the price of the product, or food waste. Sounds like a huge challenge because the plastic technology do drive and support a lot of those key attributes. What is interesting and perhaps concerning is while Canadians have a very strong view about single use plastics, our research has found 39% of Canadians are identified as a group that are not willing to significantly change their behavior related to any of their purchasing choices. So when we sit down and see, you know, do you strong, do you want to see a reduction in plastics? And they, some feel we strongly believe at almost 60, we get, well, 63%. There's a big group that's out there that are the naysayers. But then when we go into a, a market where we look at online purchasing and across other retail uh, establishments, what we've found in other research done by Abacus uh, Research, Abacus Data, is that when asked during COVID about plastics and the lack of recycling, Canadians felt very disappointed and upset. And this is what's truly complex about the discussion. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, when we talk about plastic free alternatives when uh, purchasing and we ask Canadians, there's a strong number of Canadians and most interestingly, the online shoppers who feel they would be accepting of an alternative. Um, but let's keep in mind, you have to go back to the first comment I made. Consumers want to make sure that they're not paying more for it, that their quality is there, that their uh, food safety attributes are there and so, so on. The other piece that we have to look at on any move driven by consumer preference is that in, in the environment where I live with fresh fruit and veg, where it's a highly perishable product and looking at the food safety, the food quality, the shelf life and more, we recognize one of our greatest challenges is the unintended consequences of removing certain products or technologies or plastics that could potentially impact our food waste, our price, our market conditions. And these unintended consequences have to be considered when we look at the innovations and the alternative tools. So 
all this to say, we live and operate in a very complex system. And to simplify things, CPMA began building some uh, key roadmap models back in 2019. The Plastic Working Group, which has over 28 companies, began looking across the supply chain and started to say, okay, what are the key standards we need? What are the regulation and policy modeling that we need in place at a federal and provincial and a municipal level? And the key there is harmonized. And then what is the industry and consumer communications message? Education is key here. And foundational attributes that come into harmonize systems and scalability. All of these things are key. But perhaps most important is public trust. Public trust is key to driving support and our path forward to address problematic and unnecessary plastics. While educating consumers you know, that not all plastics are alike, we also have to make sure that we are demonstrating that we are focused on reducing, innovating and recycling that we have best practices and guidelines and standards that are uh, basically the key verified and trusted systems that we can then tell our story and we can effectively educate. At the end, to make this all work, we need a strong and effective partnership between all the key stakeholders, the private sector, the public sector, elected officials, and a range of other food system players. Now, change. So where do we go from uh, at this point moving forward? Well, there's a necessary balance between private and public sector investment. Transformative change at a scale and cost that's appropriate and, and possible versus incremental innovation that can be market ready and can drive systems changes today. You know, both incremental change and disruptive approaches can show success. But the true question we have to begin asking is, which one can really enable full system change today? And change is happening all around us. We're seeing innovation and incremental solutions as well as transformative change happening. I'll give you examples like Top Seal, you know, we're not going down the discussion on whether films are recycled, but looking at the reduction of plastics and the light weighting and the benefits that we've been able to see through that process. I'll talk about the uh, recycling challenges on some of the films later, um, but small steps. On transformative change, the opportunities may be right in front of us. On transformative change, looking at some key exciting activities on genomics. On, and even bioplastics, even though there are some challenges on the, uh, on the uh, collection and recycling and the composting streams, but the potential is there. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but really at the key focal point, the system is perhaps where we need to begin. And it's perhaps our biggest challenge. You know, your packaging choice may fit in a small geographical area. It may not fit in the full complex system of municipal, provincial, and national models. So we need to start looking at how do we potentially simplify the cycle and drive a harmonized approach that looks at geography, cost, and market demand for materials. In some cases, you know, re recycled materials do not stay in the same recycling stream and especially in the same geographical area. So understanding what we need to do in our choice and our R&D is essential in understanding the complexity of where our product lands and where it goes. Now, I do wanna talk, we have Divert Nova Scotia and some representatives from uh, the, the provincial government with us. I've had great conversations with them and Nova Scotia is leading the way. You know, with over 75 uh, collection facilities across the province, 25 years of managing waste, there's a lot of huge positives. And we have to sit down and start looking then at, okay, with all those positives, where is the system moving? And some data that was shared with me looking at, you know, plastics are still an issue in the province. You know, when we start looking at what's moving the landfill, we're seeing about 30% of uh, landfill being plastics. And, you know, we, even with a, uh, an effective collection system, there's still gaps in what can be collected, what can be recycled, some being market driven relative to the cost of virgin plastics and the demand for, uh, for uh, certain polymers in the market and so on. So, you know, while this graph isn't uh, an official uh, representation, it's, uh, it's uh, giving a good snapshot of what is collected and what is uh, diverted into, uh, into landfills uh, in the province. So I wanna quickly talk about um, 
a few key questions for change and what you have to ask. So this goes into what we try and help industry to understand. So when you're looking at your packaging, start asking the question about, you know, what is my packaging problem? Have we identified what our customer wants? So what is my, my retail buyer or my, my, you know, I'm selling to a farmer's market, what, whoever it is, what do they want and ask for me and my packaging? Have I adapted my packaging to my area, specifically my municipal collection model and understanding what that market can manage? And then ask the question, am I still competitive moving to a pl new plastic type? In produce, we have a three to 5% margin. Adding 10 cents to a package is not feasible. Uh, so how do you do it in a way that still enables you to be competitive and still deliver that sustainable model? And then the realities, you know, understanding the, the regulatory environment, the global market that moves so quickly to remain competitive, as well as looking at, you know, how are we driving forward and not holding back innovation? You know, I talk about price, but, you know, is it an opportunity of understanding what the systems are that link your innovation to the systems or the products? And then I mentioned the unattended consequences of change. So making sure just jumping into a sustainable uh, package, understanding, you know, what is the uh, potential uh, off-gassing of that new product going in, if it does end up, if saying it's uh, a bioplastic or uh, compostable, you know, can it be managed and so on and so forth. Quickly want to go into just also understanding the impacts domestically. So we look at, especially in my sector, that we are global. You know, we have a massive and dominant domestic market that grows great local food, but in the middle of winter, we rely on import markets. And we also have to understand how those import markets function. So again, back to the competitiveness, also not setting rules and standards in Canada that preclude us from being strong exporters or importers to make sure we're meeting consumer demand, to address food security, to address cost, and also to address, again, the right product coming into our streams that don't end up in our landfill or our waterways. So what can we do today related to incremental change? I wanna go back to that. So that's that piece that we can see today in our market and shifts. Well, light weighting, fundamental. You know, using the right polymers, understanding what is the material you need to incorporate into your material, including more PCR. You know, the post-consumer recycled content is key as a, as a driving force moving forward. Designing with monolayer laminated packaging. The multi-layer uh, packaging is a challenge in recycling. We know that. And, you know, if doable, what is a monolayer opportunity? Working with buyers to meet consumer demands and understand what those are. And, of course, bulk loose if, if possible, reusable bags and so on. We've also created a tool and it's a material selection guide to help uh, the produce industry understand how to create a sustainable package. That tool focuses on some key areas around need, material options and how to prioritize. The decision making process in the material selection guide looks at the expectations. So again, product safety, quality and convenience, the physical properties, the barriers uh, that are necessary to uh, the product, the end of life pathways as well. So recognizing where that end of life pathway goes. And then the material options, looking at the use of the tools available, the, you know, understanding what your network uh, needs from the material, validating the, your choice of material with the appropriate science, and then narrowing that focus down. And then, of course, looking at your design implications, because you're looking at, do you need rigid? Do you need a film-based model? There's a range of different discussions you have to look at. Of course, looking at cost and trying to understand how to effectively balance all of this with the sustainable choice. So in summary, I've tried to simplify a very complex model, looking at federal rules, the diversified collection systems from uh, recycling to composting to the opportunity to reuse, the opportunity to lightweight. But there's no one component that drives incremental change. It's a multitude and it's enabling the whole food system approach. Not one group can make change. It's not a matter of just going to the recyclers saying you need to invest in new equipment. It's not a matter of just going to the researchers and saying you need to be give us a new, uh, new material that can uh, compost, that can break down you need to give me a new plastic that you know does x we need to look at this in a model that we can move forward in an integrated fashion that is scalable that removes fragmentation of regionalized modeling and enables us to move forward that can transform the opportunity that you can 
grow, produce, or manufacture your product in a region that can either be sold in, and delivered in your region and or cross interprovincial or, or national boundaries to build a market and still be confident that that package isn't going to impact a landfill and or a waterway as it moves into the recycling streams. So with that, I'll leave it for questions uh, moving uh, forward and uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Paul. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity um, to be participate uh, in your webinar today. Uh, really enjoyed Ron's uh, presentation and hopefully um, what I'm about to, to, to uh, share with you will, will, be of, will be of interest. So my name is Paul Jenkins, um, Managing Director of uh, a UK packaging innovation consultancy called The Pack Up. We work with brands, retailers, and packaging suppliers around the world, helping them with their packaging uh, projects and initiatives and innovations. Um, I'm going to be talking through some of the sustainable packaging innovations that we've been tracking uh, over the last uh, few months or so. And just a bit of context, we have this uh, innovation zone packaging database, which was mentioned at the beginning. Um, we have over 4,600 initiatives. We, we upload 20 a week. Uh, and these are from concepts, so university type developments on biomaterials and, uh, and, and things like that through to in market launches, very much a global view. Um, so that enables me to really understand what's going on and give you a sort of a helicopter view on, on what's going on from a sustainability perspective. We've just recently launched a, a global packaging trends report with over 500 uh, packaging uh, innovations in there. Uh, we also interviewed 16 experts from around the world. So hopefully um, sort of convincing you that I've got a lot, a lot of knowledge, recent uh, experience in terms of what's going on from a, a sustainable packaging trends perspective. Now, when we did this uh, trends report, we uh, sort of collated the, the, the innovations into, into nine areas. So before I talk specifically about sustainable initiatives, I thought it just be worth to get the context to go through what those nine innovation trend areas are. So the first one is called Naturally Done, and the key to that is, is to do with sustainability. And there's been a lots of uh, compostable, biodegradable, bio-based uh, examples, uh, both in development and coming to market. Um, lots of challenges around the world with uh, lack of established industrial composting systems in place. Um, and that's a presentation in its own right. Um, and you've got the dynamics of home composting and industrial composting and, and whatever. So we're seeing lots of uh, initiatives in that area. There's, there's a, a, a challenge around cost. Sometimes um, compostable biodegradable packaging can be you know, two, three, four times the price of conventional plastic-based products. So uh, not necessarily an easy challenge to, to switch to those kind of materials. And as has um, already been discussed, there's lots of issues around um, the whole market. but. Um, that, that is one area. Uh, another one is around uh, consumer engagement. So we're seeing lots of uh, initiatives uh, using smart and intelligent technology, such as um, near field connectivity uh, and the like to engage with consumers. So we're seeing lots of innovations in that way. Uh, the online e-commerce market has grown uh, significantly over the last 12 months, uh, helped um, mainly uh, through um, the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously, as, as many consumers worldwide have been compelled to, to switch from their local bricks and mortar stores to buying directly using their mobile computer or tablet screens. So we've seen a lot of a change in the um, online debt dynamics, which is reflected in the number of innovations that we're, following, we're, we're tracking. And making life easier about pack functionality. Um, so we're seeing innovations that to deliver improved uh, resealability, openability, that kind of thing. Uh, maturity change, that's about um, the switching from one material into, a, into another. Um, this is one of the most prominent sections of, 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 the, of the innovation zone. And it obviously is, is very much related to, to sustainability. Um, we're seeing a, you know, experiencing a cycle of high change where in many cases, sort of plastic is being replaced by, by other, other materials. Um, sometimes, not always, due to what uh, brands and retailers think consumers want, not what is necessary for the environment. If I'm, if I'm honest, um, you know, the, the plastic is seen 
right, you know, wrongly as, as, a, as, a, as a bad material, um, and it has its place in certain environments. Um, and uh, we've certainly seen a lot of switching out of plastic into other materials. Um, prevention of food waste is, is also uh, important. Uh, so we've seen lots of uh, initiatives that are related to protecting and preserving uh, products to increase and improve um, the shelf life. Uh, recycling is another big area, a uh, huge amount of activity, as, as you would expect. Um, but this is about increased recycled content in, 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 in packaging, um, but also improving the, the whole recycling infrastructure. Uh, we've got packaging taxes coming in around the world to uh, to encourage increased recycled content just in the UK. We've got a, a tax coming in, a, in, a, in a next year that uh, puts a, a charge on anything that has any plastic packaging that has less than 30% recycled content. Um, and we've got plastic packs around the world as well, which is, is encouraging uh, increased recycled content. So that's a big area. Um, a couple more uh, getting noticed. So that's not a sustainable trend, but that's about packaging innovations that have uh, that get increased shelf um, impact. And, and the last one, which is a sustainable one, is, is, is to do with the increase in refillable and reusable packaging. Um, so we're seeing a lot of change in this area, and that's either refilling at home uh, or or even in storage. You can see from, from that visual. So long and short of it is that of the nine innovations that we've we've, we've tracked, uh, uh, trend areas rather, that we track five are to do with sustainability. So it's fair to say that sustainability is absolutely front and centre of what the vast majority of brands, retailers and suppliers are, are, are doing um, in terms of you know, all their activities. So, and this is here to stay. So this is sustainability over the years has come and gone as a as a, as a flavor of the month almost, but that's no longer the case. We, we anticipate that um, sustainable packaging will continue to be uh, significantly important for uh, just about every new initiative coming to market. So what I've got here is following is, is uh, sort of a handful of, of innovations from our database, uh, just to give a, a reflection on, on what's going on. We're not saying that these are best practice examples or that you should switch your packaging to these formats, but just to give you a flavor for what is going on in the market, really. So um, the first one is, you know, I mentioned about, um, you know, the, the naturally done section about moving to bio-based and compostable packaging. This is, a, you know, this is an example. So this is a, a, a dual oven ball molded fiber tray um, based on US grown sugar cane. Um, it's, this is Primal Kitchen, which is a, a Kraft Heinz uh, line of bowls and skillets uh, available uh, in the US, in Walmart and uh, Whole Foods and the like. Uh, and the bowls um, are, are made using raw materials sourced within, um, uh, within the US. Uh, so, you know, that's an example of, of a, a sugarcane based uh, initiative uh, coming to market very clearly a non-plastic in its execution um, and would certainly get to consumers' attention. Um, mentioned compostability and it's, it's a big topic at the moment and lots of challenges around the sort of um, uh, the, the end of life uh, of, of dealing with compostable packaging, but cling film um, has been an essential kitchen item in most households, um, but its lack of recyclability is a challenge. Uh, so we've seen quite a few of these sort of initiatives where compostable cling film is coming in, and in this case, it's for the UK market. Um, this is a Lakeland, which is a UK store uh, retail outlet with 68 stores around the UK, and they've, um, they've announced this, the launch of this new cling film um, that is biodegradable. Um, it will com compost um, within 12 months, making it the first of the kind in the UK. Um, they've even um, taken out the non-recyclable cutting blade on the packaging, so uh, it really, um, makes it easier to recycle the outer packaging. Um, another one around the sort of the, the, the natural route. This is a Canadian initiative, um, Red Prince Apples range. 
the, uh, the bag is said to be recyclable, is reported that the fill bag will biodegrade by up to 15% in the first 30 days, and it, it is estimated to finish degradation within five years, which is obviously significantly quicker than conventional plastic. Now, there's a lot of talk about whether um, this is the best course of action for, for, for a piece of packaging, you know, should it just be recyclable? And if it's biodegradable over a long period of time, does that not just uh, encourage potential littering? So that is a, that is a potential um, uh, challenge there that needs to be addressed. Um, so the, the, the variety of different biomaterials is, is, is quite extensive. Um, this is uh, McDonald's, um, which have collaborated with a company called UBQ uh, to develop a um, their reusable food trays made from food waste combined with other, uh, other uh, trash and, and rubbish. Um, so it, it, the food waste is combined with cardboard and paper uh, and mixed plastics. Uh, any glass or metal is removed to be recycled. Um, uh, but basically they're creating you know, these, these trays, only 7,000 initially for the Brazilian market. Um, but quite an interesting use of um, materials that would otherwise be uh, end up in landfill. Um, the confection market is very active in, in, in sustainability. Nestle, uh, one of the many brand owners that have got an objective to uh, make all their packaging recyclable, reusable, or compostable by 2025, um, and they're switching some of their um, some of their ranges into, into paper-based formats, and, and that's what they're doing with the, uh, the global rollout of their Smartest range. Um, the shift will see the, the remaining 90% of the range switch to um, recyclable paper packaging. And the new paper-based designs uh, across the range and um, are made from a combination of coated paper, paper labels, and, and carton board, and of course, obviously, being paper-based, um, in this case, they are recyclable. Another example from Unilever um, for uh, uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream brand, uh, another paper-based wrapper format to replace the plastic-based format. Um, Unilever describes it as a, as a first of its kind. The wrapper is made of 88% paper and is recyclable. Um, so you know, that is a, another change that uh, is, is starting to move forward. Um, another area of development is in sort of the collation of multipacks, not the most exciting uh, activity in the world, but an important one and one that can help to reduce uh, waste and improve sustainability. Um, we're seeing uh, lots of changes from sort of plastic shrink films into, into, into cardboard. Uh, this, this new sleeve from, from Heinz for their super range in the UK uh, is fully recyclable um, and then removing 550 tonnes of plastics from uh, annually from, from, from their sort of environmental footprint. Um, the, the, the sleeve actually uses 50% less material than a fully enclosed container, as well as 10% less than the traditional paperboard sleeves. Um, these, are big, these are big changes. So this is not something that can be done lightly. Kraft Heinz has made a, a 25 million pound investment um, over, over three years to make this infrastructural changes to ensure a smooth rollout. So this isn't going to go back to a previous drink film. The move to cardboard uh, is, is a permanent change, really. And we're seeing it in beverage sector as well. So, you know, this here is an example uh, in the German market where um, a beer brand, a hand glob, has, has moved to a, a paper-based uh, carrier uh, made from waste paper. And um, so the material is, is stable and packed well. Uh, and the six packs stand out on shelf because of their minimalist design on a recycled material. Other areas, um, we're seeing lots of development. I mentioned food waste in the protect and preserve uh, trend area. So lots of different examples. This is a mimic a touch, which is um, using um, a new way of, uh, a new indicator to, to provide a more accurate exploration guidance. And obviously at the moment, um, we use what's printed on the label uh, as, as an indication of when a product can be consumed. Um, but what they're saying is that let the label, if, if it changes its, its sort of um, ha haptics and that becomes bumpy, then it's no longer safe to consume, which may actually be, be later than the use by date. So that obviously 
would reduce the amount of food that gets unnecessarily thrown away because it's still fit for consumption. So we're seeing lots of different examples in that area. And another one here from a uh, California startup um, in collaboration, I think, with uh, Procter and Gamble. Um, and they've developed a, uh, a label that uses sort of condensation to keep help keep uh, food fresh, um, which has the ability to extend shelf life by uh, up to 50%. Um, another one here from Proampac. Um, which is a flexible pouch that's now recyclable um, in, in PE film uh, streams. Um, one of the challenges is that we don't necessarily, pick, uh, businesses are making packaging changes to mono materials, but we, you don't necessarily have the, the infrastructure to recycle. So in this case, um, consumers are expected to collect the packaging and uh, drop them off in US store drop-offs along with carrier bags where available. Um, so not, not an ideal situation, but it's a bit of a chicken and the egg uh, scenario where um, you, you know, in order to make the packaging recyclable, you've got to have the infrastructure and you won't have the infrastructure without the packaging being recyclable. So that's what's going on there. Another monomaterial development, uh, just five more to go now, um, again from ProAmpac. Um, so they're, they're making sort of, um, you know, it's called recycle ready. So they're already talking about it being uh, recyclable in due course. So that's uh, uh, for, for pet food, but it has uh, applications for other food brands as well. A uh, yogurt market has, has been very active. And this is, I think, the first example we've seen of a, of a paper based uh, yogurt pot. Um, the material is at a, a higher level of recyclability in the market than the plastic it replaces. Um, the printing of product information is done directly on the pack, eliminating the need for additional materials uh, that can complicate the recycling process. And it is estimated that approximately 15 tons of plastic will no longer uh, be used in the year. So that's going on in the Brazilian market. Excuse me. And this is another example of um, Developments really to, to improve shelf life. So this is for specifically for, for avocado packaging uh, and, a, and a Spanish development team are, are using new technology uh, to use synthetic preservatives um, based on renewable sources that incorporate barrier labels to reduce the, uh, the penetration of oxygen inside the container. Um, so that, that's increasing, extending the, the shelf life of avocado by 15%, so that might be you know, one or two days extra, which can make a big difference. The penultimate example here is um, from Spain, um, and this is a obviously a paper-based uh, food uh, cardboard tray for, for, for uh, fruit and veg produce. We're seeing lots of these uh, coming to market now, sort of either hybrid paper, plastic solutions, or completely paper-based. Um, this one is oct oct octagonal in shape and has a heat sealable cardboard as an alternative to single use plastic containers. Um, is claimed that the design has a low environmental impact uh, due to its recyclable cardboard and it contains the same product for safety and performance. Uh, it, it does incorporate a thin sheet of heat sealed top film to protect the product. Um, the solution sees a reduction in plastic use of up to 95%. So it's really wiping out plastic in this case. And of course, it's 100% recyclable since both the cardboard and film materials can be easily separated. Last but not least, I appreciate it's been a, a bit of a whistle stop tour with, with, with so many innovations. It's, I'm keen to get as many over to you as I can in, in a short space of time. Uh, as, as I mentioned, one of the, the innovation package, packaging trends is is it around refillable and reusable packaging. So we're seeing lots of different initiatives coming to market. Um, and this is another example where, uh, um, a, a, again, a, a Canadian example, Fresh Prep, they deliver to uh, 20 municipalities uh, around the British Columbia area. Um, the business has announced the launch of a, a reusable meal kit container as a method to reduce uh, their environmental impact. The business is um, minimizing pa packaging waste with the introduction of a, a new insulated reusable bag called Fresh Prep Zero Waste Kit. The, the new container uh, doesn't use any single use plastic 
um, and is you know um, is a simplified and offers a more simplified and orderly cooking experience for consumers. So um, you know, that's the idea. The point of that is that it gets sent back to be reused. Uh, I think up to twenty times. So um, that was the the innovations that I wanted to to share with you, and I'd be delighted to ask any questions um, when it's time to do so. Answer any questions rather. Great, thank you so much, Paul um, and Ron. I, there's a couple of questions here specifically for Paul, so maybe we'll start with that. Um, somebody's asking about farms in Wales that are using coin-operated milk dispensing machines to sell their product. Have you seen that in action, Paul? Uh, coin, I, could you just repeat the question? Was that milk? Coin-operated milk, milk dispensing machines, yeah. To sell like yeah. a bulk type thing yeah we're seeing a little bit of that um i mean one of the challenges with milk is is, is obviously associated associated with, with, with the hygiene and, and the, the relatively low uh, short shelf life of, uh, of of the um of the produce um we are seeing it i think it's very parochial it's one outlet here and there so we're not seeing any of the big players Playing in that market, um, I think the innovation zone has tracked three or four examples. Um, the companies don't come to mind at the moment, but yeah, that is something uh, we're seeing. Sort of vending machines that you can dispense uh, produce um, of a variety of different material, uh, uh, products, yeah, um, and milk being one of them. Um, okay, we had. Um... Another question about some of the paper format that you were talking about, that was 88% paper. Uh, maybe you meant recycled content, but you, the question was, what's the other 12% made from? Uh, I'd need to specifically check on that example, but uh, that would be a, 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 some sort of plastic liner. Um, the, the, the solutions vary quite a lot uh, in terms of how recyclable they are. Um, when the plastic is of um, sufficiently low levels, it can be recycled in, in paper streams. So I think um, that's one of the challenges is, is creating the, the significant or the, 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 the right barrier um, to ensure that um, you know, the product still performs and behaves as, as well as the plastic it replaces. So I would need to double check what that 12% uh, is, but it'd probably be a plastic line. And one more, I guess, specifically for you, Paul. Uh, what's your take, I guess, what you've seen over in your area on extended producer responsibility? Do you see producers stepping up to embrace this before it becomes mandated by the government? Uh, the companies that I speak to take it very seriously. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning, we did a global trends report uh, and I interviewed 16 um, trends expert or, or packaging experts from, from around the world. And around half specifically mentioned uh, this as a uh, an area of consideration. So I think they're all working hard to make sure that they're ready for when when the time comes for when it's implemented. So yeah, my view is that it's been taken seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a bit of a flurry of activity go over in the Q and A section, and. Um, Bob Kenny has been answering a bunch of questions. I'm gonna just ask Bob if he would like to say a few words because he's been flying out answers to people. And I think there's sort of a general theme on people wanting to understand a little bit better like our constraints and where we're going with, with how produce can, or how our packaging can be diverted to compost, et cetera. So Bob, if you're there, would you unmute yourself and just maybe uh, summarize some of the things you've been talking about with people? Sure. Um, some people were asking about European examples, but um, the difficulty is you'd have to know the specific case because there's so many examples in Europe and it's so large and, and the breath is what, what it takes in. And someone mentioned Japan where they incinerate most of their garbage, which is a whole other kettle of fish. Um, we had a discussion the other day whether municipalities, I think one of them might be, I don't know if Andrew is on now. Um, and we were talking about the best packaging in the Nova Scotia context, but I would also suggest that in, in a lot of areas of the world, and, and certainly it has a paper content and no liners with plastic, um, it makes it easier um, because it can be recycled and compost in the context of Nova Scotia. 
uh, plastics, as someone mentioned, I think it got mentioned, the bigger it is, the more rigid it is, the more likely it's going to be recycled. And, and you go down the line, and, and the less rigid it is, the more film-like it is, the more likely it's going to go to garbage. Um, uh, someone asked about insects <laughs> making protein, and yes, that's that's happening in Nova Scotia too, and, and as it is in some areas of the world. Um, but I can take specific questions. I can't remember them all. Um, I, I was answering them kind of in the Nova Scotia context, but also understanding the global context to a degree. Can you just elaborate a bit on that insect question? Because I, I think people need maybe some context on that. Oh, yeah. There's fly larvae that it, uh, is being... Um, the flies, I forget the Kurt's on the online here too. You can maybe say I forget so, the soldier flies. Soldier flies, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they have been doing that around the world and they're they're they're, they're they meet the proteins, the, the compostable food. Can really of course composting, but it can be hydrated to make some proteins. You know, the flies make protein, and the protein is used for various purposes to feed reptiles or to feed fish or whatnot. They're looking to scale up in Nova Scotia, as they have in a couple of areas of the world. Nancy, Great, it's Ron. Maybe, and I know I see there's an EPR question that was posed that Paul, but I think Bob may be the right one to speak to that because I know when we we look closely at EPR across uh, across the country, BC being the uh, the gold standard in the country, um, and I see the question here saying, uh, you know, do uh, see producers stepping up to embrace it before it becomes mandated by government? It's that's a tough question because. Uh, from an industry perspective, no one wants to see added cost into uh, into a system. Um, but the reality is, sometimes you need levers to uh, to drive change. And uh, the success you're seeing in BC with a well run system um, also drives innovation. So there's a combination of success that's there, but it has to be done in the right way. And the challenge, the bigger challenge we have is. Uh, you know, New Brunswick is coming down the pipe with the potential system. Hopefully, in an Atlantic context, you see how it operates in New Brunswick, and then there's harmonized up application if if possible, so that you don't see fragmentation. Because that's perhaps more frustrating on anyone selling outside mm -hmm. of their provincial boundaries, where you know you're you're selling into another province, you're dealing with another set of rules, you're selling into another, and you're not sure whether or not your product is moving to the channels it needs to move. Uh, with the best of intention of investing in the right recycled content uh, and or uh, material uh, for composting or whatever. So the, uh, yeah, the complexity is there. Um, I have a question about, while we're on the topic of legislation, um, I feel like it would be very important for us as a society to start um, working towards mandatory labeling of all packaging for end of life disposal, because consumers are confused. Yeah. Sometimes we're confused. We don't know if something's recyclable or not. And if it was mandatory to state that on the package, it would also put more onus on people to work on this and come to, um, you know, so they have these like, um, you know, optional things you can do such as uh, how to recycle label. So it tells people exactly how to dispose of the package at the end of life. But I, I just wonder someday will we get to, or are there other places in the world that are already doing that where the, the um, supplier of the food has to state on the package what to do with the package at the end of life? Mm -hmm. um, we had this discussion within our working group and, and there is an, uh, an appetite to seeing a standardized approach for labeling. Um, what that looks like is key. And, and it's one thing to say national in context. Um, global in this case right because uh you know it's it's it would be ideal to be able to uh you know have a product leaving the country knowing it's going to be uh understood and then product coming in and understanding that same approach but uh the how to recycle is something i know a little frustrating for people the pay to play model is not something anyone likes uh so it's exclusionary right you uh it is only, not cheap yeah. yeah it's not cheap at all so but it's the best of intention. So how do you how do you enable an industry to uh, adapt and deliver on something? If there was a uh, standardized model across uh, across Canada, that would be much easier to uh, internalize. You would need almost a standardized system across the country in order to get a standardized model, and because <laughs> systems vary so much within a province, within a country, within a, a globally, it's it's really tricky. We all want that. I agree with you. <laughs> that was that was my point as well. That, that there's such a lot of variation between different places. Uh, you know, just UK, for example, I think we had 
500 different um, local authorities with 450 different policies on recycling. So to, to have a mandatory um, pack display would, would, wouldn't work because you could travel five miles down the road and suddenly your, the pack that you could recycle at home could not be recycled. So uh, it's a real, real challenge. And there is truth to that, although I would add that if you had an entirely paper package, the vast majority of places in the world, when they recycle, they recycle paper, so it can go into the paper stream. Mm -hmm. And it happens to be a composting system there, it can go into the composting stream. So paper has more flexibility. Plastics, dogs are flexible. And for anyone who's unclear, EPR is Extended Producer Responsibility, and it refers to the onus being put back on the supplier to handle the end-of-life activity. So that um, is happening, I guess. Out in BC is the only place so far, Ron. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, we uh, have... the, yeah, the film, ahead. I see a question here on compostable film. And, yes. uh, and Bob's smiling because I, I'm, I'm, this is uh, one of those pieces that I think film is the nemesis of, uh, of all the, uh, of the collection systems, um, whether it's compostable uh, or not. So I don't know if, don't, Nancy, it just caught my eye, but I think it's important to talk to because that's where I was going to go next. Actually. Oh, I'm glad because it's yeah. it's being sold, and this is the I use the term one source of truth, and uh, we talk about it regularly. Uh, and there's a lot of people trying to I don't want to say snake oil, but uh, there's a lot of people trying to sell sustainability, and it's not necessarily greenwashing because they're they are right. potentially sustainable products. But again, understanding the complexity of the system and how they operate is key. So I don't know, Bob, if you want to talk about films. Well, just in general, films are an amazing product. You guys know that better than I do. And, and certainly when, when you choose it, it has a lower carbon footprint. But from a composting and recycling perspective, it's pretty much garbage all around the world. I think we have some of the highest rates of film capture rate in the world in Nova Scotia between 15, 20% at most. Um, and I've seen numbers all around globally around 1%. Um, and that's usually wrap around pallets. So it's a great product from one perspective, but from a, a diversion perspective, it's, it just doesn't um, measure up. And I guess the, the, one of the things to consider is the whole food waste question. So if you're getting yeah. a longer shelf life because you've used a film that can breathe and allow your produce to last three times as long, you might still be ahead on your overall uh, right. footprint because food waste also costs a lot of energy, um, Right. money and all kinds of things so yeah it's, it's always it's a trade -off. a lot of these complicated issues we, the is, next so you, question is also about salad specifically and and that they need a clear container and you know going back and forth on this sometimes going with a recyclable plastic is the best option because you're in, like if you're looking at overall footprint your input um to make the plastic if you're using like some recycled content and you're it's a recyclable option it might be the best way to go. So on that note, I think, so I'm part of the Canada Plastic Pack that recently launched. And uh, I encourage everyone to visit the website. Um, the, the key here is that it's more than just food. You know, the, the, plat, the, the perimeter of the store, this is going to center store. It's talking about a, a, a sector-wide approach, including everyone. And, and it focuses on the opportunity for increased recycled content and some of the low-hanging fruit to try and drive forward on. Um, and I think really at, at, when we sit down and look at I think Paul noted the thing, looking at your packaging choice, understand what your municipality and or region is, uh, is able to support focus on some of those key products and, uh, and materials that can be driving and then look at the innovations that are, that are potential within a cost center that's affordable to your operation and that's acceptable to your, your supply chain. Um, because like, like I mentioned, this isn't a standalone discussion anymore. When you're talking about your package, you should be connected with your municipality. You should be connected with your the, the customer, the retailer or wholesaler you're working with. And it should be an open, honest discussion around you know, how do we work together to put the right material in the, in the market so it ends up in the right channel that does not, in an ideal world, end up in a, in a landfill. But uh, We had a question about biodegradable inks. Hmm. Is it a problem with, uh, with printing uh, for composting? 
It's been a long time since I've heard that discussion because inks used to have metals in them long, a while back. But to my knowledge, most of them are vegetable based and they've never been yeah. a problem. There, there's very few, if uh, at least some produce, a lot, a yeah. lot of people are now moving to uh, a vegetable based ink. That's right. Somebody's asking, uh, going back to product labeling, what if the product label reported the proportion of waste centers that could handle that product in a sustainable way? That's a good idea. Is anybody doing something like that so, around? So things? you know what's funny? I in all of our work, we've tried to find one area that can bring together all the provinces and all the, you know, similar to Divert Nova Scotia has done, showing all of your uh, recycling centers, all of your collection centers. You have to go to, you know, multiple sources to try and find it. I have not found one centralized uh, model yet to be able to understand to create that. So it would be an extremely difficult endeavor in my mind. One more quick question for uh, Paul. That uh, compostable cling film, or what we would call saran wrap here, is that oh, <laughs> Is it made of cellophane or is it, enough? do you know what the material is? Um, it, it won't be cellophane, it'll be some um, plant-based material. Because uh, I think the original it. cellophane was from trees, right? Way back when we- Yes, were... cello, yeah, absolutely. But um, I mean, we, we've tracked probably, I mean, it seems to be in the, in the last six months of quite a few introductions. Uh, started off in Australia and New Zealand, funny enough. Um, a company called Compostic, I think. Um, there's probably six or seven, maybe eight examples around the world, and they all do something slightly differently. They all offer a, a slightly different end of life uh, solution. I'd need to look at the specifics in terms of the um, material composition of them, but um, yeah, obviously plant-based is, is, is one of the ways of achieving compostability. Right. Um, I just had a couple more slides here. Anybody got any final comments? We're gonna wind things up. Um, yes, yeah, so what extended proof responsibility was, um, I just saw in the questions, um, in a packing perspective, just so you know, I was actually editing uh, an extended proof responsibility guidance document, uh, a national one that the Canadian Councils and Ministers and the Group are putting together on EPR uh, so we can get that consistency and harmony across the country, at least for Canada, if not, uh, hopefully that will extend further. Uh, but extended producer responsibility for the person that asked is, is having the packagers play a prime role in the, uh, the recycling of their packaging if they are large enough. Just, just so you know, for all the small guys, the vast majority of them are not involved in this system because they're too small. Uh, you know, a farmer's market or whatnot just wouldn't be there. Um, but uh, it means that they're, they're, they're legally obliged to be part of the system. And some uh, industry are actually welcome that, like, uh, for example, Loblaws and others. I mean, they're not begging for it, but they, 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 they have their triple bottom line, social environment and whatnot. And that includes supporting EPR from the perspective of they take responsibility for it. So they get together with the factors and they figure out how to make the system more efficient, more recyclable. Increase recyclability and increase recycle content. And Loblaws is launching Loop this month, apparently. Uh, uh, Loop, the re reusable container. So we'll see how uh, that goes. Yeah. Um, thank you so much to um, Ron and Paul for your presentations and also to Bob for jumping in with so many of the questions. And please feel free, people, if you have um, everybody who's attended, if you have more questions that didn't get answered today, um, just feel free to drop an email and we'll get um, an answer to you as best we can. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.